One of our favorite guests is back on the line with us, calling all the way from Paris today. Isaiah Henkel, the cheeky scientist, is with us now. Welcome. Oh, my goodness. From Paris, I'm having a little bit of jealousy right now, Isaiah. Welcome back to Smart Life. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Junior. It's good to be back. It's good to have you. Now, you have to catch us up, Isaiah, on uh, on uh, what exactly, can, can you tell us what you're doing? You're kind of on a sabbatical. Is that what I understand? Yeah, a little bit. I'm, I'm actually over here getting ready to promote my book that's coming out in May. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Very, very cool. Well, I took note of a recent post on your website called uh, 99 Things Wildly Intelligent People Refuse to Do. And that's what I want to talk about because being intelligent isn't always about the things that you do. It's often the things that you refuse to do. So, uh, yes. so I wanted to ask you about that. First of all, how do you research this kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it can be quite exhaustive, but I, I do a series of things. I go through books, and I like to combine a little bit of academia with a little bit of research that's out there from some peer-reviewed journals and and books, you know, popular books, whether it might be something like Outliers or uh, more pop culture stuff as well. Kind of a kind of a fun mix. So so just uh, pulling together all the research that's out there and uh, and putting it in your blog. Yeah. So so what are some of your, if I can ask you quickly, what are some of your favorite sites for things that, you've written a lot of articles that are along these lines of the things wildly intelligent people refuse to do. So tell us, what are what are some of your favorite sites, if you'll share those with us, of course, besides your own, which you can always promote. <laughs> yeah, well, um, one that I, that's kind of my go-to is PubMed or NCBI, which has, a, it's a, the best collection of peer-reviewed journals out there, so you can actually look at what so the cutting-edge science is saying about things. So I go to those, and then there's some other uh, good websites and, and and blogs online that'll collate a lot of a lot of those different articles, and then books. I'm I'm also an avid reader, and I I like to uh, pull from books that are out, like nonfiction, science books, business books, and especially books that kind of cross over between personal development and science. I like to keep it rooted pretty heavily in science. So before we get to some of the things that your list says, I want to talk for a moment about your personal definition of intelligence because, as I mentioned, I have a friend who, uh, tremendously successful inventor, marketer, um, multi-multi-millionaire, and can't read or write. Nobody knows this. And so I, I just want to, I want to talk to you for a moment about intelligence because one of the hardest things about saying how to be more intelligent is, and measuring intelligence to me is actually figuring out what we mean when we say intelligence. Yeah, and I would say the simplest definition would be the ability to make choices that get you to where you want to go hmm. or, or get you to be the person that you want to be. So it's kind of that line between point A and point B, essentially, is, is your intelligence. Right, and also how you live your life in between, the, in between those two points. So, so can somebody be super intelligent, by your definition, and be very sad? Be very sad. Sad. Um, if their goal was to be sad and they made intelligent choices to get them at, to fulfill that goal, then yes. Okay. Now, what, if, what about can someone be super intelligent, in your opinion, and have no sense of humor? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think we've met some of those people before. <laughs> okay. Well, I just always think it's interesting to try and figure out what, what we mean when we say intelligence. But let's move on to the things that make us uh, wildly intelligent, as you worded it, that people don't do. What are some of the biggest mistakes that we see in our everyday lives that say, oh, my gosh, that person must not be wildly intelligent if they're doing that? Yeah, if I had to consolidate it, I mean, the, the biggest thing is, is I'd say, is misaligned priorities. Mm. Like, people want certain things, or they want to become a certain person, and then they rank things in their lives um, out of order, right? So uh, the, the first couple of items to put on there is that a wildly intelligent person refuses to sacrifice their health to their other goals, for example. Because without your health, it doesn't matter if you get to the top of the mountain, you're not going to be able to enjoy it once you get there. Uh, also, people that are unable to cut off bad relationships in order to reach their goals. This prevents them from getting to where they want to go. So refusing to do these things, that, that's a critical part of, of being intelligent and making intelligent choices. 
When you talk to people who've met their goals and they and they have made um, decisions that have gotten them from point A to point B, as you talked about, um, what are the things when they look back that they think, gosh, I wish I'd done this differently? So people who have accomplished their goals, but just think that they got there more slowly because they tripped over X, Y, and Z. What are those factors? Right, so there's a big difference between achievement and fulfillment. And intelligent people can do both. And, and so what that means is, you know, one of my favorite stories is Deion Sanders. He, he won the Super Bowl twice. He played with the Cowboys. Uh, the second time that he won the Super Bowl, he went home and he was drastically depressed. And his wife asked him, what's wrong? And he said, well, I thought, I thought there'd be more than this after wow. achieving my lifelong goal. And it's because he had achieved something, but he wasn't fulfilled. And, and that's because being intelligent comes down to, or living a good life comes down to not only outcomes or accomplishing your goals, it comes down to how you're living your life and who you're becoming and what you're putting as your top priorities. Because if those things aren't right, and it doesn't matter where you get, you're still stuck with who you are. And that's not the person that, that, you, sh that you should be uh, based on what your priorities would have been for you to feel fulfilled. Okay, what do you tell people, though, Isaiah, who say, I, I want to live this intelligent life, I, I want to uh, do the things that are fulfilling to me, but I can't diagnose myself. I, I think it's almost easier to look at someone else's life and say, this is what that person should do. <laughs> We're all good at that, right? But, but looking at yeah. ourselves and saying, um, what will really fulfill me? Because if winning a Super Bowl isn't on that bucket list, it really makes you ask some questions, doesn't it? It does, and, and, and that's a great question. I think there's two things. First, I tell people to focus on the, the daily actions and the feelings that they want to have you know, day by day once they've achieved their goal. Don't focus on a job title, for example, or uh, annual income, or even you know, a championship ring. Focus on what you want to wake up and be doing. What, what actions do you want to be taking? Focus on the feelings, because that's your ultimate endpoint, and then you can work backwards from there. And then number two, Focus on why. Why are you doing the things you do? Most people do things either because they're trying to go towards pleasure or away from pain. And, and usually it's the latter because we hate pain more than we like pleasure. So what things are you running from, so to speak? If, if you can understand that, you'll understand yourself and you'll understand what you would really want out of life. I think, though, there are people who get fulfillment um, from things that would never fulfill other people. And I think some of that has to do with s silly things like personality type, um, uh, maybe even just energy level. I've noticed for myself and for other people who are type A that we have just a voracious appetite to um, accomplish things. But then there's less satisfaction almost after the accomplishment takes place than there is in the idea of that accomplishment taking place on your way there. What do you know about type A, type B personalities, or however it is you would like to define personalities in terms of uh, satisfaction ultimately with realization of accomplishment? Did that question make sense to you? No, it does. And, and yeah, there are a lot of different personality types, whether, you know, there's been a lot written about introverts versus extroverts, for example, type A versus type B. And it really doesn't matter what type of person it is. It comes down to one thing, and that's self-awareness, knowing how you're living your life and, and what will fulfill you. And taking the time if, after you achieve something to celebrate it. You have to celebrate the small wins actively. Maybe for a type A person, that's a little bit harder to do. You have to slow yourself down and make sure that you enjoy and soak up what you accomplish because it's in line with all this work you just did over the last few weeks, months, or years. So again, self-awareness, I think, is the key to that question. That, that's a great point, and I think it's one of the hardest things, honestly. I think it's a special intelligence of its own because you do meet yeah. people who just seem to be very in touch with their own motivators, their own reward systems, um, even just their own what makes them actually feel good about themselves. And I think you meet others who go through their whole life and they accomplish all these things. They win Super Bowls and accomplish all of their career goals and maybe even accomplish their family and education goals and simply uh, can't feel it as well. What do you say to no, those people who just have that trouble actually feeling whatever their successes are? Well, I would say, number one, know that you need it. Know that it's important. Uh, I work uh, a lot in the biotech and pharmaceutical industry, and these people, these, these professionals, will spend thousands of dollars going to a conference to learn one new small distinction in a very narrow field, okay. but then they won't spend any time or any money on themselves 
learning how they think or making one new distinction in their own mind about how they operate on a day-to-day basis. So I'd say understanding, you know, just like a business has to keep spending money on R&D, research and development for themselves to get better, you have to spend money on yourself, time and money on yourself, on your own personal R&D. That's a great point. And speaking of, a good place to start would be the Cheeky Scientist website. Give us that web address. Yes, it's uh, www.cheekyscientist.com. All right. Safe travels to you, my friend. Thanks so much for being on the show, Dr. Henkel. And up next, we have a man who is helping to bridge the gap between amateur, self-educated scientists and the professionals. He's also going to tell us about biohacking and how we can hack into our bodies and make it run more efficiently. You're not going to want to miss what he has to say coming up next on Smart Life. Stay with us.